Chapter 941 Disloyal Knight Beast Soul The fist carried a destructive light. The power was so great that it shone straight through Han Sen's hand like an X-ray, revealing the skeleton beneath his flesh. Han Sen's Water Thunder skill smashed against the disloyal knight's back. Boom. When the Water Thunder came into contact with the knight's blood, it electrified the being. The crackle, sizzle, and pop of the lightning strike grew louder and fiercer until it crescendoed in a dizzying firework of electricity. Without Super King Spirit Mode, the body of the disloyal knight was not blown to smithereens. Still, it froze and paralyzed the knight, inhibiting any further movement from it. This was exactly as planned. The Dragon Blood Snake and Moment Queen both recollected themselves and did not spare a single moment in taking the opening Hansen had created. They raced towards the disabled knight that could not currently move. All the knight could do was try to block. With each hit that landed on his defenses, the force pushed him back. The attacks mounted, and the rate of fire against him steadily increased. When the knight looked ready to lose all control, Hansen fired coins onto his body. The pressure of several mountains weighed upon him, slowing him down considerably. When the disloyal knight finally buckled under the pressure of the relentless attacks, Hansen had fired a dozen coins upon it. Since Hansen had opened his second gene lock by now, they were far more effective, too. Dragon Blood Snake and Moment Queen did not cease in their merciless assault, particularly now that the coin laden knight was unable to fight back. The knight was maddened by what was happening, and its mind could not fathom losing to them. As much as it wanted to lash out and do something, its health was being slowly whittled away, and the coins prevented it from doing anything. The weight that disabled it only got increasingly heavy over time, as well. Hansen himself took advantage of the situation he had stuck the knight in. He noticed their fruity foe was still trying its hardest to resist its predicament, and he also noticed the negative effects the halo upon its head continued to exude. But still, he knew that he had all but triumphed over the frighteningly powerful treeborn nemesis. It had been crippled by the weight and repeated attacks. It was no longer a threat to him. The disloyal knight had countless coins stacked on it. Boom. The disloyal knight could no longer withstand the pressure. It submitted to the weight and collapsed to the ground, entirely immobile. Hansen, the dragon blood snake, and Moment Queen did not lax. They all continued to batter the monster and after a few more minutes of such a treatment, it died. Super Creature Disloyal Knight Killed Beast Soul Gained The flesh of this creature is inedible, but you may harvest its life geno essence. Consume its life geno essence to gain 0 to 10 super geno points randomly. Hansen was exuberantly happy. Not only had he just slain a super creature, but he had also received its beast soul. He was a lucky man. Hansen's joy was given a momentary lapse, however, as he contemplated the string of events that led to his ability to kill the creature. He was incredibly fortunate to have dislodged the super creature, despite the fact that it wasn't fully matured. The disloyal knight's body vanished, but in its place rested a copper life geno essence. Hansen gladly accepted it, for it was the first life geno essence he had received in the third god's sanctuary. Even he was surprised he was able to acquire one so soon. After the knight died, the tree died along with it. Bringing it into the shelter now would be pointless. Still, this did not disappoint him too much. For now, he was simply pleased that he had gotten the beast soul and the life geno essence. Quickly returning to the underground shelter, he spared no time in summoning the beast soul he had just received. A copper-plated knight appeared in front of Han Senator. There was no halo above its head, but the armor was complete. Disloyal knight. Super pet beast soul. As glad as Hansun was, he was a little upset to learn it was a pet. That meant it would take a long time for it to be raised, and he couldn't use it for a while. If others learned he had a super pet, the attention he would receive would be insufferable. It'd undoubtedly create another big fuss. After the ordeal, Moment Queen returned to the spirit base. In her absence, Hansen decided to refine the life geno essence. He simulated the energy flow of the night and consumed the orb. He received five super geno points. Perhaps it was because it hadn't fully grown, or that it was a first generation super creature, but receiving only five points was a little disheartening for Han Sr. The shelter, after another couple of jumps, reached the outskirts of Thorn Forest. Creatures were finally appearing now, and it looked as if Han Sun could start hunting again. With little wind and the dragon blood snake, 
Hansen wasted no further time and left the shelter to kill as many creatures as he could. It wasn't long before Hansen was able to max out his ordinary and primitive Geno point tallies. Hansen did not know which area he was in, and he wondered whether or not there might have been a shelter nearby. If there was, he didn't want anyone to discover the location of his shelter, so he didn't allow his shelter to advance any further. He preferred walking a greater distance if it meant less exposure. Wherever he was, though, it was far away from the human shelter he had previously discovered. It was even further away from Ching Ming's shelter. Regardless, it wasn't a coarse area of woodland. Low-level creatures populated the region, which made for more relaxing hunts. After walking 50 miles, however, Hansen stumbled across another shelter. It appeared to be a night-class shelter. From what he could see from the outside, the interior seemed to resemble some sort of ancient city. Hansen saw many humans there, and that excited Hansen a great deal. If it was a spirit shelter, there'd be many creatures in and about the shelter as well. Fortunately, they were absent, so he thought he was in luck. Hmm, but why do they only stand there on the inside? Doesn't anyone want to come outside? Hansen pondered the curious sight. Normally, he'd have met and greeted the humans already. The fact that there was not a single human outside of the shelter struck Hansen as strange. After contemplating it some more, Hansen decided to approach the shelter with equal amounts of confusion and concern. Chapter 942 Abandon the City? What are you doing out there? Get in. Hansen witnessed someone calling out to him. When Hansen entered the shelter, he was able to get a better look at the people who seemed unwilling to go outside. They looked awfully glum. It seemed as if something bad had been going on. This was a small town, a night-class shelter that provided residence to around 30 people. It wasn't the worst location for people to band together in the hostile lands of the Third God Sanctuary. Is something wrong? What's going on here? Hansen asked the middle-aged man who had called out to him. Hmm, I've never seen you before. Are you new? The middle-aged man didn't respond to the question he was asked. Yes, I've only just arrived, Hansen said. Well, that's unfortunate. You may think spawning in a human shelter is a good thing, but we're about to lose the place, the middle-aged man said with a sigh. Why? Hansen asked. The middle-aged man explained, 20 years ago, we conquered the shelter and built it up as a safe refuge for many people. A few days ago, a creature discovered our shelter. It's not your average woodland critter, either. It is a foul beast, one that came here from the north. The creature belongs to a royal shelter someplace in the mountains of that region, and we have been informed of an impending assault. The leader of that shelter is determined to lay waste to our little sanctuary. How did you learn about all of this? Hansen asked. He thought it was strange that they would even know about the shelter that lay to the north. We have a man in their shelter. He has risked life and limb to provide us this information. But even so, with all the knowledge in the world, there is little that can be done. We don't have the manpower to withstand an assault like the one that is said to be coming down on us. We only wonder now whether or not we should make our glorious last stand here or flee to the wilds, the middle-aged man explained. Hansen, understanding their predicament a bit better, acknowledged the direness of their situation and their hesitance to defend the shelter against the hostilities of the North. He could tell they were weak and had no chance of protecting their home. As Hansen retreated into thought, a loud noise brought him back. It was the tolling of a bell in the plaza. Old Huang is summoning us, the middle-aged man told Hansen, before proceeding to the plaza. Hansen followed the rest there, as well. Normally, many would take a newbie under their wings and treat them well. They be asked many things and offered an all-around welcome. Under the current circumstances, however, few cared enough to make the effort. Things were bleak for them. After all, a man with white hair was ringing the bell. A man Hansen naturally assumed was Old Huang. For a moment, Old Huang's eyes fell upon Han Senator, then the man's eyes moved on. The time is nigh. Now we must decide. Do we fight or do we go? Old Huang finally spoke. Against the darkness that fast approaches, raise your hands if you wish to flee. Everyone looked at each other before making a decision, but ultimately, almost all chose to raise their hands then perhaps it is for the best. Let this be our final night of refuge and what has become our home. Tend to any last duties and prepare yourself for the road ahead. We leave at first light on the morrow, Old Huang solemnly spoke. After his speech concluded, everyone stood where they were. They all knew it would be best if they abandoned the shelter. 
But the sudden realization of this loss was difficult to swallow, and they knew once they departed, they'd have nowhere else to go. There was going to a great deal of hardship for them, beginning the next day. Some of the older community members had put their hearts and souls into securing this place, and spent the years toiling hard to make it prosper. They felt the most agony in understanding they would soon depart the safety of its walls. Go home, Old Huang said, returning to the podium he had spoken from. They had been there many years, and it was their home. But if they didn't leave, it would swiftly become their grave. Unless they were willing to obey a spirit for what would likely be the remainder of their days, they had to flee. And even if they did decide to accept a lesser fate as thralls for a spirit, there was no guarantee the spirit would even want their service. They might have been killed even in surrender. But the majority still wanted to leave, of course. They wouldn't allow a spirit to dictate their fates if they had the choice. They determined their own destiny, and that was how it would remain. Still, leaving their home behind was a difficult thing to come to terms with. Hansen observed the life forces of the people around him, and he noticed many of them were quite skilled and powerful. Thirty such people in a group was quite impressive. Can I say something? Hansen broke the silence. Everyone turned to look at Hansen, and when they did, Old Huang said, of course. Speak, we are all family here. We should fight, Hansen said. Old Huang, with a wry smile, said, Young man, I understand the zeal of youth and the way in which you feel. But you must understand, we face the unyielding wrath of a royal spirit. They have at least fifteen mutant creatures. Even if half our people went to face that wall of terror, there is little we could do. Do you think we would leave if we had what it took to fight, Grasshopper? Hansen wished to say something more, but a young person who stood near old Huang suddenly asked, are you Hansen? Yes. Hansen nodded. Little you. Do you know who this young man is? Old Huang asked. He is Hansen, the son-in-law of the president. He is a great man. He is the one who defeated the royal Shura, Little you explained. After Little you said this, people recalled the name and the deeds he had become known for. Even the elderly of the shelter had heard of Hans Sr. If you choose to flee, then flee. But if you decide to fight, you have my full support. Not only will we defeat those who believe they can trample us underfoot, but we will strike back and claim that northern royal shelter for ourselves, Hansen proclaimed. Little Han, we would like to, but we don't have the power. It is a struggle to maintain our current grip on the shelter, Old Huang confessed. Do you not believe we can stand firm against the assault on the shelter with this? Hansen summoned his dragon blood snake. Chapter 943 Defending the Shelter This is Old Huang and everyone there looked at the dragon blood snake in wonder. They thought it was some small, average pet beast's soul. Hansen let the pet do the explaining for him, by having it unleash its gene locks. When the first gene lock opened, the dragon blood snake's body grew to the size of a tiger. When the second gene lock opened, the dragon blood snake's body grew to the size of a bull. When the third gene lock opened, the dragon blood snake's body grew to the size of a golem. When the fourth gene lock opened, the dragon blood snake's body grew to the size of a giant beast. When the fifth gene lock opened, the dragon blood snake's body grew to the size of a dinosaur. A pet beast's soul with five of its gene locks opened. The plaza gathering had quickly become an audience, and they were each amazed by the mutant pet. Then, the dragon blood snake hissed and grew in size one more time. Its red scales glistened as it became a terrifying beast of gigantic proportions. It looked ready to murder any that offended it. Six gene locks? The best possible mutant pet one can claim. Someone in the crowd shouted, Old Huang, with this snake. Do you think we stand a chance of repelling those who seek to remove you from your home? Hansen posed the question. That just may be possible. Although he tried to hide it, his loosely bottled excitement began to overflow. Although the spirit shelter that opposed them had many creatures, it was very unlikely there'd be a creature amongst them with an open gene lock tally anywhere close to the snakes. Mutant creatures could open six gene locks at the most, but that did not mean it was achievable for all mutant creatures. And now, it wasn't only Old Huang who got excited, as hope of a future in their shelter returned to the crowd. This mutant creature can at least kite three creatures for us, and with us there, valiantly fighting alongside it, we may just pull through. Yes, let's fight and prove to that spirit we're not to be messed with. We're not leaving this place. F asterisk CK those spirits. Aside from a few of the elders, 
Everyone who saw the snake had a change of heart they were keen to vocally express. Old Huang told everyone to calm down soon after, however, and then told Hansen, I would like to ask you a few questions, Han Senator, and I would like you to answer my questions seriously and truthfully. This is a matter of life and death. I will gladly answer your questions, Hansen said in response. Where did you come here from? Did you travel here from another shelter? Old Huang asked. Yes. Hansen nodded. Hearing this, Old Huang also nodded. Then he asked, if we succeed, will you remain with us? Everyone understood what Old Huang was implying. Even if they could withstand the attack, Hansen's absence after that would mean they'd have no more manpower if something sought to retaliate. They would still be vulnerable. Fighting now would be pointless if it meant they'd only fall in the future. Everyone looked at Hansen, hoping he would choose to stay. I will leave, Hansen answered. Everyone looked disappointed. It felt as if their newfound hope had been dashed across the rocks. I appreciate your honesty. Old Huang did not hold it against Hansen and understood why he'd leave. Hansen was a famous person of much renown. He had a dragon blood snake with six of its gene locks open. He was destined for a place greater than the little shelter he had stumbled upon. He was bound for someplace far grander, for sure. I have not finished. I said I will leave, but only under these two conditions. Firstly, we claim that royal shelter. Secondly, if we fail, I leave the snake behind, Hansen said. Everyone looked surprised, and in response, Old Hawk asked, Do you speak the truth? If you don't believe it, I can give you the snake now. Hansen was not afraid of any potential theft, and didn't think they'd refuse to return it. Had they sought to, there was nowhere they could run off to. They were in the middle of the woods with a small army of creatures preparing to wipe them off the face of the sanctuary. To do so would be futile. If the people did not stand and fight for their shelter, they'd most likely run off into the forest. Engaging the strength they possessed, Hansen believed they did not have the metal to survive in that domain. Hansen knew the end result if they chose to flee, so he felt compelled to help them. Hansen would use this opportunity to raise his mutant geno point tally, too. It was far more difficult to do when flying solo, after all. The people there weren't that strong, but many could challenge and rival mutant creatures in strength. If Hansen could use this opportunity to obtain a royal shelter, it would be a terrific result, as well. Little Han, you are the president's son-in-law, so of course we believe you. Old Huang was not stupid, and he most certainly would not have kept the snake. Now, following Han Sen's promise, everyone readied themselves for a fight and geared up in the best armaments they possessed. So, which shelter seeks to destroy you? And what is its master? Han Sen hadn't been told the name of the shelter that sought to conquer them, so he asked for elucidation. It's Thorn Shelter, and its master is Thorn Baron. She is a royal spirit, and she is wickedly powerful, Old Huang said. Hansen was surprised to receive this answer, and so he said, Ah, uh, then we are in the regions that belong to Thorn Shelter? Hansen became the de facto leader of the shelter for the time being, and others relied upon him to establish and organize their defenses and tactics for the coming battle. He was capable. When it came to leading others, he might not have had what it took to command large armies, but a group of about 30 people was within his comfort zone. Hansen was able to use his formations to effectively coordinate the others. At first, others did not trust Hansen, but after some more practice with the formations, they listened and paid greater heed. They soon realized the true talent he had, and so they were all able to work together in greater cohesion and synergy. Three days later, the spirit army had yet to arrive. Hansen traveled to a nearby knoll to see if he could spy any movement. Chapter 944 The Hunt Begins Hansen ascended a mountain, led by an old man. He was on his way to Thorn's shelter. The mountainsides were steep, and unlike the woodland that circled them, they were barren. The environment there was poor, which provided little reason for creatures to visit. As such, there was a noticeable lack of them. The old man did not go too far across the mountain, and when he decided to return, he instructed Hansen on which way he should go. Hansen's purpose for making this venture to Thorn's shelter was to meet the person who had supposedly risked life and limb in warning the night shelter and its inhabitants of an imminent attack. After 100 miles of travel, Hansen was finally able to lay eyes on the black shelter which resided on the peak of that mountain. Above the foothills of the mountain, Hansen caught sight of creatures running to and fro. The human who delivered the news was said to live separate from the shelter, 
in a house that had been built in a nearby valley that was said to resemble the shape of a fish's mouth. When Hansen came to that valley, he spotted the house. It was wooden, but ill-kept and all-around ugly. Hansen did not approach as he frequently did, casually and without care. He instead chose to approach stealthily. There didn't seem to be anyone around, so he waited for the onset of night. As the sun was being reclaimed by the horizon once more, a man returned to the house. The man was built like a tower, and when Hansen saw his face, he couldn't help but quietly exclaim in shock, Tiger of Blue Blood, Tai Yi. Hansen and Tai Yi once butted heads in a competition for a military position. He beat Tai Yi, thereby becoming Ji Yinran's bodyguard. This allowed him to remain in the sanctuaries while he served in the army. Who's there? Tai Yi was quickly alerted upon hearing Han Sen's unexpected outburst. Long time, no see. I didn't expect to find you here, as a courier of bad news to the shelter that lies a good distance south of us. Hansen arose from the bushes and smiled as he delivered his dialogue. Hansen? Why have you come here? Tai Yi appeared to be just as surprised. I have come here to find out when Thorn's shelter plans to begin its assault. Hansen smiled. Come inside, it would be best if we spoke there. Tai took a gander at the surrounding environment and then opened the door. Hansen followed, and when he entered the shack, he closed the door behind him. There were no chairs inside, so he had no choice but to sit on the floor. Hansen observed the decor and decayed architecture of the home he found himself sitting in and was surprised to see it so bare. Items of comfort were in short supply, and the majority of what lay scattered about were tools. There wasn't even a bed frame, mattress, or duvet. Have the people in that shelter evacuated? Tai asked. No. We will fight Thorn Baron and slay her, Hansen said with confidence. Are you people insane? She also has a multitude of royal spirits in her service. They would be all that is required to conquer that shelter and its meager populace, Tai finished with a concerned frown. That won't happen. We have a nice howdy duty prepared for whatever threat comes our way. But can I ask if you know which spirits and creatures are to be rallied and sent against the shelter in the planned assault? Hansen asked. Unfortunately, Tai shook his head, saying, I am only here to grow geno vines for them. That's all. I was lucky enough to overhear the murmurs that spoke of their planned conquering of that shelter, but I've been here long enough to learn a thing or two about how Thorn Shelter and its occupants operate. If Thorn Baron is going, she'll lead the battle with eight mutant creatures. Hansen nodded and said, And when are they planning to strike? Tai shook his head and said, I have told you everything you need to know. You and your people should leave, for Thorn Baron's power is unmatched. She will slaughter whoever remains there. Hansen smiled and said, A matter of principle is involved in all this, and as easy as it would be to run away, we can't do that. We, nor the people who initially claimed the shelter way back when, will not throw away all they have built. If you don't run, then at least consider a surrender. You might still walk away with your head attached to your shoulders if you do that, Tai Yi offered. It was, he believed, the only alternative to flight. I am confident we can defeat Thorn Baron. After a pause, Hansen continued by saying, You can remain here. When we launch our counterattack, we will save you. Tai looked strangely upon Han Senator after a moment of contemplation, he said, Are you naive? Are you stubborn? Or are you just too thick in the skull to not hear what I'm telling you? You don't actually have a plan, do you? And a viable one at that? I won't tell you more than you need to know, but I will save that shelter. Hansen smiled and then continued by saying, Now, tell me about the mutant creatures and the royal spirits we might expect to see. I don't know much, but... Tai told Hansen all he knew. After asking a few more questions, Hansen decided to return to his shelter. Seeing Hansen leave, Tai could only sigh before closing the door behind him. Back in the shelter, Hansen continued to refine and formulate more plans for the upcoming siege. Thorn's shelter was far more powerful than he expected it to be. If Thorn Baron decided to bring ten mutant class creatures, even with the snake on Hansen's side, they'd pay a high price in blood to secure the shelter's freedom and future. I think we should strike first. We can take the fight to them and battle them beyond the immediate borders of home. Hansen decided to return to the Alliance. Hansen figured he needed a good bow, one that was good enough to slay mutant creatures. He had already maxed out his ordinary and primitive geno points and managed to obtain seven sacred geno points, as well as five super geno points. His fitness was over a thousand points by this point, 
and that put him in the range of mutant creatures. If he had a quality bow, he could make use of the flaming arrow he received off the porcupine and further increase its efficiency and power by employing the drill at arrow skill. Killing the mutant creatures should not prove too difficult. The Alliance had many powerful bows he could use for such an occasion, but their use required much strength. Not everyone could use them effectively. With a fitness level of 1000, Hansen would only be able to use such a bow once or twice in rapid succession. Hansen received a bow from Annie. The Z-Steel arrows that were available for purchase would be ineffective against creatures of the Third God Sanctuary, so the best arrow to use would undoubtedly be his flaming arrow. Hansen brought the bow and arrow with him as he snuck near Thorn's shelter. He wished to find Taiyi again, but before he could, he saw a group of people approaching him. Hansen went into hiding and watched the people go by. They were all so strong, it was clear that they hailed from Thorn's shelter. When Hansen saw the leader of the collective, he was delivered another shock. It was the female spirit he had once encountered in Thorn Forest. Chapter 945 The Unseen Shooter She is Thorn Baron. Hmph. I suppose that rules out my use of the red dagger. If she sees that, she'll recognize me. Hansen was glad he had decided to bring a bell. After opening his second gene lock, Hansen's Dongshin aura had improved a considerable amount. Its effective radius had greatly increased, and it now allowed Hansen to inspect and observe every member of Thorn Baron's team. The team was massive. A royal class spirit accompanied Thorn Baron, and seven mutant class creatures encircled him. There were 300 primitive creatures in Thorn Baron's company, all in all, and even with the dragon blood snake on Hansen's side. If they were to triumph, it would be a hard fought victory. It is lucky I came out here to scout. I may have gotten everyone killed, had I chosen to remain in the shelter waiting for all this to descend upon them. Hansen continued observing the creatures. He knew he'd have to start taking them out, thinning the herd before they arrived at the night shelter. All he would have to do was wait for the right opportunity to start doing so. Spirits would respawn, so killing the creatures would be the best course of action, since it dealt permanent damage to the strength and integrity of the enemy horde. Henson spent time looking at the seven mutant creatures the Baron had brought with her. A gold-winged hawk was one of them, and it flew high above the rest, as if an airborne defense. Its eyes flickered with gold lightning, as its body glistened in the warm rays of the sun. It was a powerful Thunder-class mutant creature, in terms of the damage it could deal out. Hansen, however, could gauge the strength of its defense and tell that it had a weak body. It was like a glass cannon. Its weakest spot, Hansen could detect, was a furry section on its chest. It was even less sturdy than the plated wings. Hansen remained hidden for the time being, clutching the bow he had borrowed from Annie. He summoned his flaming arrow and knocked it on the string. Having prepped himself for dealing with the host of creatures he would engage solo, he pulled the string back. Hansen suddenly felt very heavy. He had to exhaust all his strength in preparation of firing the bow. The bow was aimed at the exposed spot of the gold thunderhawk's chest, and the moment it spread its wings to reveal it clearly, Hansen loosed the arrow. Without making a sound, the arrow glided towards its target without drawing any attention to its presence. It pierced directly through the hawk's chest causing it to gush blood in a cascade to the ground below. The hawk cried out, fell to the earth, and after a few futile flaps of its wings in an attempt to return to the skies, died. Everyone and everything that accompanied Thorn Baron saw it happen and were dazed. The Baron herself was shocked, seeing one of her most prized creatures suddenly assassinated. The creatures and spirits all peered in the direction they believed the arrow had come from, and without hesitation, the Baron barked an order for them to annihilate the hidden assassin. When they arrived in the area where they suspected the arrow had come from, there was no one there. No sense or life force revealed the presence of an enemy in that place. Mutant creature gold Thunderhawk killed. No beast soul gained. Consume its flesh to gain 0 to 10 mutant geno points randomly. Before Hansen could even hear the announcement chime, he had already vanished from the area. He was not afraid that others could find him as he was able to erase any indication of his life force and even the precise trail of the arrow. Unless they could see the arrow, no one could detect where he might have attacked from. Hansen used the skill called Arrow, which masked the flight of an arrow and made it incredibly difficult for people to deduce where the attack originated. If he had not done this, he might not have been able to kill the creature without catching its attention and giving it a chance to evade. 
He thought it was a shame he could not retrieve the dead body, though. When Thorn Baron noticed that the hawk had been murdered, Hansen was already long gone. He simulated the powers used by Chu Lanchi and massed his scent. Although he wasn't as proficient at it as she was, it was still good enough to mask the sin of one person. Even mutant creatures that were of the same level as Hansen would not be able to detect him. And the creatures that were naturally talented in detecting scents and life forces were unable to detect Hansen due to his Dong Shin aura. Like a ghost, Hansen weaved his way between the trees. With his bow raised, the flaming arrow was knocked and ready to fire again. How can there be no one there? Thorn Baron frowned. Roar. As Thorn Baron mulled what phantom might have decided to attack them, she was suddenly interrupted by the cry of another creature. An arrow of fire had pierced through Gold Talon Wolf's left eye. It writhed around in agony as the arrow vanished into thin air. Blood flowed out of the annihilated eye socket in a gruesome stream. It wasn't dead yet, but it would be soon. Thorn Baron looked angry, and she herself raced towards the area where she believed the arrow had come from. But when she reached there, as reported by others in the first location, there was no one to be seen. No life force could be detected, and it was as if her team was being assassinated by a ghost, one by one. Who is this? Who is out there? Reveal yourself. Quit hiding in the foliage like a rat and face me. Allay your cowardice for a time and fight me like a real warrior. Thorn Baron exclaimed to the trees, but was met with no response. Roar. A primitive class beast was killed. Thorn Baron's formation of creatures descended into anarchy and chaos. They looked around for their phantom aggressor, but it could not be found. Spirits and creatures searched high and low, but they were jittery, each fearing that they might be the next to greet the murdering arrow. Catcha. Another arrow was fired into Gold Talon Wolf's right eye. The same fire arrow that had initially dropped it had returned to finish the job. A few creatures leapt to where they believed the arrow had come from, but there was nothing to be found. The spirits and creatures were terrified, as if the reaper himself was playing some game with them. They did not know who would be the next to go, or when they would be taken. Mutant creature Gold Talon Wolf killed. Beast soul gained. Consume its flesh to gain 0 to 10 mutant geno points randomly. When the wolf died, the announcement played inside Hansen's head. Chapter 946 The Creatures Attacking Walk in a circle and keep walking. Thorn Baron was angry, but she had to maintain her composure in order to effectively lead and issue appropriate commands for the situation. Hansen's arrow was a silent killer, but it could still be seen with the naked eye. Thorn Baron's subordinates were situated in a formation that allowed them to carefully watch in every direction. If an arrow was fired, it'd definitely be seen. Hansen's arrow delivered terrible damage to the creatures it struck, but if the creatures were able to see it come their way, they could block it. Unable to find a decent opening for the time being, Hansen had no choice but to fall back. Removing two mutant creatures from the field of play was good enough for the time being. There were five mutant creatures and two royal spirits remaining as the key figures of the enemy horde. With the dragon blood snake on their side, they stood every chance of defeating those who sought to oppose them. Thorn Baron's people, following this, walked at a much slower pace in fear of another ambush. When Hansen returned to the night shelter, they were still descending the mountain region he had engaged them on. Hansen had been able to get a reading of the power of the mutant creatures and spirits remaining, so he returned quickly to make some final adjustments to his plan. Five mutant creatures and two royal spirits? And only three hundred primitive creatures? Perhaps you are correct. Perhaps we really can win this, Old Huang said, with tempered excitement. By committing to a strong defense, we can employ a great advantage over the assaulting force. The primitive creatures are only cannon fodder and are not a genuine threat for the time they remain in the open. All we must fear is them breaching the wall. Someone else chimed in to say, Their numbers are too many, and ours too few. We don't have enough people to effectively guard all four walls, another man said with a frown. We have to try. We have committed ourselves to this. We have no choice, someone else said, with a clap of their hands. After the discussion, Hansen went to the spirit hall. It was situated in the center of the shelter, and from there, he could see all four walls and their ramparts. They're here, someone proclaimed, riding into the shelter. The time had come, and even though they had steeled their hearts for the hardships to come, they were still in shock. They all looked to Han Sen for the initial instructions. You know the plan. Everyone, get to your positions now. 
As Hansen issued the command, he summoned Dragonblood Snake, which went to the northern side of the shelter. He also had Little Wind with him, who he told to stay near one of the walls. Hansen stood atop the spirit hall, not planning to leave. He didn't care much that his fighters were feeling nervous, only that they did as they were told. He now looked at his Gold Talon Wolf Beast Soul. Mutant Gold Talon Wolf. Weapon Beast Soul. Hansen summoned it, and a fong-like dagger appeared in his hand. It was not as lethal as the red one he had been using, but it was still a powerful weapon. I am Thorn Baron. The shelter and the lands that encompass it are to be relinquished by the current inhabitants and given to me. If you wish to escape the feudal death that will result from pointless resistance, your lives can be spared and forfeited to service beneath my rule. Thorn Baron was not in a good mood. And I am just a soldier. If you wish to escape a feudal death that will come about from pointless attempts of shelter conquering, your lives can be spared and forfeited to service beneath my rule. I could do with a pretty new maid. A man called Shin Lei spoke aloud in response. The humans around him all burst into laughter, and they did not appear as tense as Thorn Baron had expected. As a Baron of Thorns, I'm used to dealing with pricks, but you. Thorn Baron's mood went from sour to curdled. Hearing this, she became angrier than ever. Not in the mood to negotiate any further, she commanded her creatures to begin their assault. Hansen had drafted many different plans, but most of them seemed to be pointless now. Perhaps it was due to her impatient mood, but her entire host seemed to only attack from one sole direction. I overestimated her intelligence. Hansen had a wry smile and commanded everyone to the defense of the northern wall and ramparts. He also went to accompany them there. With Thorn Baron's less than efficient method of assault, the pressure they had each been under was lifted by a great degree. Having 30 people to guard the northern wall was more than enough. Monsters roared, explosions sounded, thunder struck, and humans shouted their war cries. The variety of noises melded together to form the grand soundscape of war. It was a magnificent scene. The walls were being shredded by blades of wind, as fireballs were also hurled at it. A creature that looked like a leopard started to scale the stone wall, and just as it was about to reach the top, a human plunged a sword deep into one of its eyes. Blood squirted from the puncture, as the leopard dropped back down to the chaotic ground below. Roar. A tiger that was wreathed in fire appeared and announced itself. Its body was sturdily built like a tank, and its mere presence was enough to exude a feeling of dread on those that saw it coming. Boom. A red shadow jumped out of the shelter and lashed out against the terrifying tiger. It was sent flying through the air, on a low trajectory which had it knocking down trees as it went. The dragon blood snake cried out at the foes that assaulted the shelter. With a simple swing of its tail, eight primitive creatures were instantly slaughtered. A black eagle circled the air and cast its own wind blade down below. A titan-like beast brought a battering ram towards the gate of the shelter, and with each pounding impact, the shelter rattled and vibrated. Hansen did not fight during the entirety of this. He merely commanded the dragon blood snake and the humans that fought valiantly in the defense of their home. As good as things had been going so far, Hansen believed the enemy was more formidable than he had initially assumed them to be. They even had two mutant creatures with them that had unlocked five of their gene locks. The flaming tiger that had been knocked away had six of its gene locks open, just like the snake. The humans were in a bad spot, and the battle was going to be far tougher than they expected. But calmly, Hansen watched and commanded his troops to repel the invasion. And with his improved Dongshan aura, he could keep track of all the humans and creatures. While things would be okay for now, he knew he'd need an additional trick to give his team an edge. As such, he spared one part of his mind for figuring that out. He knew he could maintain a stalemate, continuing as he had been, but a surefire victory would need something more. If this isn't enough to win, we may have to cut corners. Hansen observed Thorn Baron, who was standing behind her army. She too observed Hans Senator. She believed the humans would be easily defeated and was surprised to see such an effective resistance. Of course, she knew this was down to the person commanding them. He attracted her gaze. Chapter 947 Dead Man's Arrow My Baron, do you wish me to rid the field of that human? The royal spirit dragon demon asked. In response, Thorn Baron said, Yes. Do it at once, quick and clean. We have wasted far too much time as it is. Yes, Dragon Demon said. He was clad in black armor, and with a black dagger in hand, he raced towards the gate. His eyes looked on Hansen with the desire for cold-blooded murder. 
When Hansen saw him come, he frowned. He knew this latest foe would be a more formidable opponent than the dragon blood snake itself. The odds truly were against them, it felt. Thorn Baron's team was, on the whole, significantly stronger than those who defended the shelter. Old Huang, take the reins of command. Hansen leapt down into the chaotic battlefield below. If he wanted to halt the incessant advance of the creatures, Hansen knew he'd have to take down Thorn Baron. If that didn't happen soon, he'd have no choice but to summon Moment Queen for aid in the shelter's defense. Hansen did not want to make his ownership of Moment Queen public yet, so he decided to go solo for now. Old Huang was shocked to see Hansen so casually descend onto the battlefield. How Hansen would survive, amidst the carnage, he could not even hazard a guess. The humans that fought were starting to realize the creatures were stronger than they initially believed them to be. To them, Hansen's sudden behavioral shift was like suicide. Of course, Hansen did not think this way. Although the Baron was physically stronger, it was a situation he wasn't likely to drown in. He knew he could hold his own against her. And for as long as he remained fleet of foot, Hansen wouldn't find himself surrounded by the creatures of the battlefield, either. He could detect and respond to each and every creature movement. The moment he leapt from the ground, he'd know exactly where to land and what he'd do next. Left and right, Hansen swerved, bent, and twisted his way through the hordes of enemies like a breakdancing leopard. The entire scene looked as if he was running through a number of bushes, yet not a single leaf touched him. It was wild to watch. Despite the countless creatures that thirsted for his blood and did the best they could to stop him, nothing could come close to touching Hans Senator closer and closer. Hansen advanced to the approaching royal spirit. Arrogant, Dragon Demon's eyes were filled with the desire for slaughter. The black armor began to generate scales as horns formed atop his helmet. The black claws were like the fangs of dragons, and they looked indestructible. Hansen could feel the staggering amount of power inside his latest nemesis, but it did not make him afraid. He didn't feel any hesitation, even in the knowledge that his own speed and strength did not match that of the spirit who desired his blood. Hansen and Dragon Demon's shadows flickered past each other. But before Hansen could launch his fist, slashes were carved in his chest that exposed his ribs. Catcha! Hansen coughed out a glob of blood as a river of claret oozed from his chest. He fell to the ground with no sign of life. He was a dead man. Dumb human. He could not even recognize the difference in strength between us. Thorn Baron looked upon Hansen's lifeless corpse with disdain, then she issued one more command. Kill the remainder. Yes. Dragon Demon was delighted to hear this, and he took off running towards the shelter. He was confident in his powers, and he could sense there was no more life force inside Hansen's body. There was no longer any need for him to concern himself with the human that so stupidly engaged him in battle. A primitive creature then jumped onto Hansen's body and tried to devour it. The remainder of the humans, those left guarding the stronghold they had spent their lives in the Third God Sanctuary building, were sad. They saw what had happened to the man they believed to be their savior, and felt the zest and zeal to fight being sapped upon the realization the hero Hansen had been killed. Don't give up, people. We still have a chance of securing victory. Old Huang could not give in to sadness, and he did his best to instill some confidence in the people who were valiantly fighting for their lives and future. He saw the dragon blood snake continuing to fight out on the battlefield. If Hansen had truly been killed, the pet beast's soul would have disappeared. But the dragon blood snake was still fighting as hard as it could against the flaming tiger, indicating Hansen was still alive. Old Huang was not sure what game Hansen was playing, but he knew this was all part of a greater plan of his. Things weren't over yet. Seeing the humans continuing to fight, Thorn Baron smiled mockingly. Dumb humans. Then, all of a sudden, an arrow was flying towards her face. She felt a searing heat approach, and the hair of her head cinched. She recognized this to be the arrow that slew Gold Thunderhawk and Gold Talon Wolf. Thorn Baron was quick to react, though. With a hearty rose, she tried to deflect the incoming projectile, but the arrow acted as if it had a mind of its own. It swerved to the side and lodged itself in her throat. Thorn Baron looked down on the protruding arrow, her face consumed with disbelief. She tried to speak, but only pathetic gurgling sounds came out as she choked on her own blood. Her eyes moved up to observe the battlefield. The dead man was stepping on the corpse of a primitive creature. He held a bow and mocked her in return. Thorn Baron had wished to later cut his lifeless body up into pieces to release her anger. But now, 
she could do nothing. The life was leaving her body, which began to fade away. The entire battlefield came to a standstill. Immediately, all the creatures retreated. Chapter 948 Fair Trade Dragon Demon cried against the insubordination of the creatures that wished to flee and yelled at them to stay, but they did not listen. He lacked the authority, for he and the creatures had signed a contract with Thorn Baron. She was the sole person either party could accept commands from. The humans were exuberantly happy, following the quick turn of events. Under Old Huang's lead, they chased off the creature horde into the woods and away from the shelter, slaying stragglers. I'm going to kill you. It was through Dragon Demon that Han Sin was able to feign death and kill Thorn Baron. And seeing Dragon Demon come for him, Hansen called for his dragon blood snake to back him up. I will kill you, maybe not now, but someday. I promise you this. Dragon Demon knew he could not defeat Hansen under the current circumstances. So, he pledged an oath to kill him, turned, and departed the battlefield. There was no point going after him, though. His spirit stone was nowhere near, and any victory against him would be short-lived. With the dragon blood snake at his side, Hansen instead decided to call as many of the fleeing creatures as he could and thin the horde that would soon recover their numbers and personal strength in Thorn Shelter. Mutant Creature Pillar Titan Killed. Beast Soul Gained. Consume its flesh gain 0 to 10 mutant geno points randomly. Hansen and the snake delivered the beatdown upon the creature. Through the entire ordeal, this only marked their third kill of the evening. Receiving another beast soul was remarkably fortunate. With most of the horde dispersed, scattered in flight across the thick underbrush in a desperate attempt to return home, Hansen turned away and focused his attention on the primitive stragglers he could more easily capture and slay. Humans won the fight, and they were treated with many spoils for their bravery. Plenty of beast souls had been collected and much creature flesh had been harvested. The only thing that disheartened Hansen was the size of the creatures they had slain. While bringing such foes down was an impressive task, the hulking bodies meant their consumption would be slow, and many mouths would have to work on the same meat. Still, it allowed for a feast in the victory celebrations that were soon to follow. Hansen summoned Meowth and Disloyal Knight to feed them. The knight, however, didn't even look at the food it was offered. Another picky eating bastard. Hansen unsummoned the knight swiftly after. In the celebration, Hansen was treated as a hero, and he was almost made drunk. In Thorn Shelter, things were expectedly glum. The beautiful Thorn Baron was furious over the events that had transpired. That obscene asterisk shoal. I'm going to have him hung, drawn, and quartered. The spirits and creatures in her presence all trembled in fear of their matriarch. The last thing they wanted to do was say or do something that displeased her even more. No one wanted to incite her ire in her current frame of mind. They did it. Tai wore a complicated expression and he struggled to wrap his head around the fact Thorn Baron and her army had been beaten back. It was a shocker to learn that the little human shelter had claimed victory. He had never been so surprised as when he saw a horde of worn-out creatures scramble their way through the gates of the shelter. After a while, he decided to count how many creatures had returned. He was even more surprised to learn five mutant creatures had not come back and were likely slain. How in the sanctuaries did he pull this off? He actually wished he had been there fighting alongside other humans. Such a battle must have been a glorious spectacle. Unfortunately, he had signed a contract with Thorn Baron. Back in the Alliance, Hansen went to meet up with Ji Yin and in the virtual community. He told her about the battle he had been in. Ji Yin An was happy for him, but she still had to plead that he try to remain as safe as possible. The Third God's Sanctuary was a dangerous place, and she wanted nothing more than for him to be secure. Shortly after their meeting, Ji Yin and had to return to work, so she left the virtual community. Before he departed, however, Hansen stopped Annie. Annie, can I borrow this bow for a while longer? Hansen ordered the construction of the very same bow for his personal use, but it'd take three months to be completed. Liking it very much, he asked her if he could continue using hers for the time being. Bows like this required much hard work and delicate deliberation in their crafting. They were extremely valuable and even with present technology, mass production of such a bow is impossible. Sure, but how about you do me a favor in return? Annie said. Do what? Hansen asked. I'm joining a surpasser party. I'd like you to accompany me, Annie answered. You? Partying? Hansen looked flabbergasted. 
Hansen had always taken Annie for some sort of lifeless robot that followed Ji Yin and around like a shadow. He had never seen her demonstrate much emotion, and neither had he seen her do anything remotely interesting. He had never even seen her visit the sanctuary. And now that she was saying she was off to a party, Hansen was taken aback. Yes, so will you come? Annie Coley asked. Um, of course. What kind of party is it? Hansen needed the bow to hunt, so he knew he had no choice but to join her. Oh, it's just to get together with some of my old friends, Annie said. Friends? You have friends? Hansen's mind struggled to think what sort of people would want to be friends with Annie. Forget it. Give me back my bow. Annie's temper suddenly flared up in anger. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll come. I'll come. No questions asked. Just tell me where to be and I'll go, Hansen swiftly pleaded. Go to the Atlantic planet. Someone will come pick you up there tomorrow. After saying this, Annie promptly took off. Atlantic planet? Isn't that Lonti's family's planet? Hansen thought to himself. Lonti's family was similar to Angel Jean and was one of the big four, but Lonte did not sell anything remotely similar to the angel fluid. Lonti's family only produced money. It was the oldest and biggest bank in the Alliance, and most other banks referenced and cooperated with them. There was an organization in the Alliance called Levo Federal Reserve. It was connected to the economy and was an independent department. Not even the president had the authority to control them, solely. If something needed to be changed or done, it had to be agreed upon through a vote. Lonti's family was the boss of the banking world, and no family could avoid having some form of ties with them. As a result, they had an unprecedented amount of influence in the alliance and council, and no single person could ruin their reputation. The G family and Lonte family had business together, but hearing Annie was going to a party with them, Hansen couldn't help but be surprised. Chapter 949 Special Collection The next day, a spacecraft came to pick up Hans Senator clearly, but perhaps unexpectedly, and he had revealed herself to be a bit of a scrooge. The spacecraft was only a shuttle that was to bring him and Annie to the spaceport so they could charter public transportation and make their own way to Atlantic Planet. Did you have a blind date with one of their men? Did you not fancy him enough for a second date? Am I to come along with you? Also, you can pretend I'm your hot and sexy new boyfriend? Hans suggested, giving Hansen a side eye, and he told him, if you, in any way, ruin my chances of dating and subsequently marrying a man from the Lante family. I will kill you. Each and every person from that family is a better example of a human being than you. That's disappointing to hear. Hansen let out a chuckle, but then went on to ask, So, why have you asked that I accompany you? Shouldn't I prepare before we get there? And he said, There is no reason. They know I work for Captain G, but since she's too busy to come, I'm having you take her place. You are, unfortunately, her fiancé, after all. So, I'm only a substitute? I almost feel insulted. Hansen feigned sadness, but then went on to say, But what about these friends you say you have? Provided they are genuine human beings, are they people you met in the third god's sanctuary? No, it was from my time in the second god's sanctuary. Annie paused briefly before continuing. In the third god's sanctuary, I am in a restricted area. A restricted area was a place that was previously owned by humans, but was then taken over by spirits. Humans who teleported away could not return. If they did, they'd either be forced into slavery or killed. Unless someone fancied being a thrall to the whims of a brutal spirit, such people could never go back. Ah, that's why she's always around in the Alliance. That's why she can follow Ji Yin and like a puppy, Hansen thought to himself. Then he said, What is your shelter called? If there is a chance I can reclaim it for you, I'll do my best to help. Then, you can return to the sanctuary. Beast Shelter A spirit emperor conquered our shelter, one who went by the simple name of Beast, and he coldly said, as the haunting, previously suppressed visions flickered across her eyes in remembrance. Hansen could only present a wry smile, because he knew there was no chance he could take on an emperor spirit. Well, I may not be strong enough to help you now, but one day I will be. And when that time comes, I'll help you, Hansen kindly told her. Annie believed he was only saying that to comfort her. Taking down an Emperor-class shelter was an impossible feat, she thought. When they arrived on Atlantic Planet, Lon T's people were there waiting. They brought them to the yard. Annie had told Hansen that she had befriended people in the Second God's Sanctuary, people who were forming an army. 
She had been positioned vice commander of the forces, while the leader was a man from the Lante family. His name was Lu Ming. Lante Lu Ming? That's a mouthful, Hansen commented. Annie rolled her eyes. She told Hansen he was an important man of the Lante family. He was just unfortunate to receive a long and girly name. When they arrived in the yard, Lu Ming was there to greet them. He looked quite different than Hansen had imagined he would. He didn't have the signature blue hair and blue eyes of the family. In fact, he looked like any other person in the Alliance. He was fairly handsome, but plain. And much like everyone else in the Alliance, he had black hair and black eyes. You are Hansen, I can only assume. Finally, I get to meet the man. Lu Ming was polite, and there seemed to be genuine enthusiasm and passion in his mannerisms of speech. Hansen expected an encounter with another rich snob, so it was nice to know he might be spending time with a humble, educated gentleman instead. When they entered the lobby, there were many other guests there. All the members of the aforementioned army came forward to greet Annie. Seeing Ji Yin and was not accompanying her, they were disappointed. Fortunately, Hansen had made a name for himself, and they weren't shortchanged. They thought he made for a fine substitute, and due to them being keen on meeting him, as well, things weren't too awkward. Annie was a quiet person, and whenever she was asked a question, she replied in as few words as she possibly could. Have you heard tales of a powerful spirit said to be rising through the ranks? It is said he destroys any spirit he goes up against. Oh, you mean the king? Of course, I've heard of him. I live in a shelter that belongs to Thunder Devil King's father. His son was one hit killed by the king. Ugh, that's just what we need. Another wretched, looming threat for us humans to worry about. Spirits are born stronger than us. As everyone dined and drank, they somehow ended up discussing the king. Hansen, what are your thoughts on the king? Lu Ming asked. He sounds strong. Hansen wasn't sure what he should say as, unbeknownst to them, he was commenting on himself. Everyone thought Hansen could provide a professional review or an insightful observation of what the new threat might have been. They were taken aback by the response he gave. You have just become a surpasser, have you not? It is normal that you do not understand, I suppose. Lu Ming smiled and then went on to say, There are many smart and powerful spirits in the Third God Sanctuary, but we're not too far behind. We have angel gene fluid and pet pills. In time, we will bridge the gap that separates our power from the spirits there. The speed of our development will only increase beyond that, too. People were very interested in Hansen but they were surprised to see he mostly ignored everyone else there. Hansen was not a quiet person, but still, he wasn't much of a talker. He could only relax when he wasn't the center of attention or being asked a bunch of questions. Annie had been pulled away by a few of her girlfriends, so Hansen focused his attention on the chefs in the kitchen. From the open view, he was able to watch them prepare and cook their meals. But as he watched, the housekeeper came over to Hansen and said, Mr. Han, my master wishes to show you his collection. What about the rest? Hansen looked around and saw that Lu Ming had gone. My master tells me the special collection can only be shown to special people, the housekeeper said. Chapter 950 Special First Time Hansen followed the housekeeper out into the gardens. The area glistened like polished jade, and it skirted the edges of a lake. In the middle of the lake was a stone pavilion. Lu Ming was sitting there, and he smiled at Han Sr. Mr. Lu, is the collection you wish to show me the fish in the lake? Hansen approached the stone pavilion, and aside from the active fish below the glass surface of the water, saw nothing else there of note. Lu Ming, in response, said, The collection I wish for you to see is right before you. You can't be talking about yourself, can you? Hansen looked at Lu Ming with wide eyes. With a serious look on his face, Lu Ming answered, Yes, I have never fought anyone before. I have practiced and done all manners of training, ascended ranks at an alarming pace, but never before have I fought against another human. To me, it is a valuable collection, and I wish to give this to you. With a wry smile, Hansen said, I think you have the wrong person. Shouldn't you give this to someone who is more qualified? Lu Ming calmly responded, as a family member of Lan Te, I am provided much care and protection. Even in the sanctuary, I am given everything I need without challenge. This is a good thing, isn't it? Hansen said. The Lante had business with every aspect of the alliance, so such treatment was not unexpected. And Hansen believed this to be a great thing. Lu Ming nodded and said, This is good, yes. But personally, 
I feel that it is wrong. And yet, no matter how hard I try, I am still nothing before the Lante glory. Hansen did not say anything. The two were nothing alike, and Hansen had been raised in a completely different manner and environment. It would be impossible for him to empathize with Lu Ming. I like fighting, and I am learning the arts of combat to the best of my abilities. However, all I challenge never treat me as a proper opponent, Lu Ming explained. Hansen thought to himself, isn't the reason why obvious? Who would dare harm you? The moment I saw you fight Yu Chelan, I knew I would have to make you an opponent. Lu Ming looked at Hansen with much excitement. Hansen had no idea what to think or feel. He hadn't done anything and had never met Lu Ming before, yet the man wanted to fight him. The way he spoke made it sound as if they were destined to compete. Two, Hansen wanted to tell him, what makes you think I'll challenge you? Lu Ming smiled and drew a short sword. He placed it onto a table and said, I know I'm putting you in an awkward position, but if you can beat me, this sword is yours. No, I am too weak to go up against you. Why don't I recommend you to fight someone who is truly powerful? Hansen spoke, but then retreated into his mind, thinking, even if you gave me a billion, there is no way I'd beat up a son of the Lante family. Lu Ming slid the short sword across the table, closer to Han Sr. Look at it, would you? This is a weapon that comes from ancient times. Its name is Taya. Han Sen had no knowledge of ancient weaponry, but he knew the blacksmithing required in the past could not compete with what was produced in the current age. Humans were still primitive back then, and even metals such as Z-Steel hadn't been discovered. Hansen picked up the short sword, and when he felt the power inside it, a chill ran down his spine. Hansen observed Taya. The blade was shorter than two feet, and the metal had a certain reddish hue to it. It almost looked as if it had been crafted from bronze. It wasn't blood red, it was more like the last light of a sun that was to dip below the horizon. The bronze, elegant sword looked cold and murderous. But the sword had been crafted from primitive materials, so it wasn't as if it could serve as a suitable weapon. Even a knockoff Z-Steel sword could break it with the greatest of ease. This sword was created in a country called Chu. Its crafting was the joint operation of two expert blacksmiths, and it was a gift for a king. It became an infamous, well-renowned sword following the king's rule with that weapon, Lu Ming said. Hansen was not much of a fan of swords. To Hansen, practicality always came first. The relic he was handed, he believed, should have been placed in a museum. You must think this is some useless sword hailing from a bygone era, but you'd be forgiven for thinking that. Lu Ming knew exactly what Hansen was thinking. The blacksmithing of ancient times can't hold a candle to what is done today, right? It might look good, but it is undoubtedly weak. I can't say I'm much of a fan of art, Hansen clarified his true feelings. Lu Ming did not speak, but instead drew a dagger of his own and attacked Han Sr. He was not expecting Lu Ming to start a fight there, of all places. And being caught off guard, it was too late for Hansen to dodge. He did recognize that the dagger being used against him had been crafted from Z-Steel, though. In a flash, he used Taya to block the incoming attack. He was planning to evade as soon as the sword began breaking. Katcha. Something broke, and it was not Taya. It was the Z-Steel Dagger. Hansen observed Taya in his hand, and then looked at the Z-Steel Dagger's severed blade. He was shocked. Taya was not always a short sword. In the past, Taya was once a five-foot-long greatsword. After it was cut in half, it was refined into the weapon you now hold. The remainder of the blade that was broken is in the possession of the Qin family. They continually try to buy this back, but I reject them each time, Lu Ming said.